the problem is sin. The problem is that human beings are alienated from God, and they have been from the beginning of time when we had Adam and Eve, the first human beings who were given the, the simplest of commandments, don't eat from that one tree, and they violated that commandment. They violated the first covenant between God and human beings, and they were exiled from the Garden of Eden, put into wandering, and doomed to work hard and to um, to have pains in childbirth, etc., and to carry the stain of sin. And sin then in the Christian tradition is not just wrongdoing. It's this condition that human beings have that leads them to be alienated from their true selves, to be alienated from one another, and to be alienated from God. And the solution is salvation. And how do you get salvation? Well, Christians have been arguing about this forever, but my understanding most simply is God comes into the world in the form of a human being named Jesus, and he lives a sinless life, and he dies on the cross, and somehow in dying on the cross, he takes these sins that we have onto his own person, onto his body and his soul, and he makes it possible for us to have our sins taken away, which allows us to go to heaven, which is a place that cannot tolerate sin. So salvation is that that release from the taint of sin that allows us to uh, to go to heaven. But then what is the technique that Christianity recommends or techniques for identifying or becoming part of what Christ did to bring salvation? Well, it's interesting because often these religions are going to agree on the problem solution, but then they have divisions inside them often about the techniques. And this is and part of what you call, I think, the dizzying diversity of Christianity. That's right. And, and, you know, the classic distinction here is that, well, Catholics say to get to heaven, you need to be a good person and you need to have faith or trust in, in Jesus. And Protestants will say, no, 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 you, a good person has nothing to do with it. That's what the Reformation was about. Sola fides, faith alone. Um, so that combination or that notion of faith is there for Protestants and then some combination of faith and works for, for Catholics. Mm. And I think it would be fair to say that today in Christianity, some of the lines, you know, are blurred in various traditions. And I think that's particularly true in the United States where there's a blurring between Catholics and Protestants especially and where the old denominational lines where people used to care about, you know, if you were Lutheran and you married a Methodist, it was a mixed marriage, right? Uh I think now we don't think that way and we don't even think that Protestant Catholic marriages are mixed. And so uh, more and more people are thinking of themselves in the United States less in terms of Catholic Protestant and really more in terms of conservative Christian versus liberal Christian. And I think that's where the divide has really gone in the 20th century. And That's the real mixed marriage, a progressive Anglican and a conservative evangelical maybe. Exactly, exactly right, where they're going to disagree about questions like abortion and how you read the Bible and and – all, all the sorts of contentious, quote-unquote, culture wars matters. Mm. Now, when you describe Christianity, you talk about a soft monotheism. And I can hear various scholars and theologians saying, what do you mean soft? What do you mean soft? Well, it's soft in comparison. And, you know, this is one thing that I try to do in the book is is to think about these religions in comparison. And we know, you know, if you were raised a Christian, you're told that this is a monotheistic religion. But it doesn't look very monotheistic compared to Judaism and Islam, but it looks pretty monotheistic compared to Hinduism, for example. So um, there's a great description of monotheism by uh, the novelist J.C. Hallman where he talks about the Trinity as triplets perched on the fence between polytheism and monotheism. And that's what I mean by the kind of soft monotheism of Christianity that you have the three persons, right? You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And immediately I'm hearing Jews and Muslims in my mind saying, what? You know, three is three. One is one. You know, how can, how can three be one? And similarly saying, God doesn't take a body. It's just wrong to think of God as having a body. That's what both Islam and Judaism warn against. Don't divinize a human being. God is up there, different from us, and humans are down here different from God. So that's what I mean by soft monotheism. It's a monotheism that's not nervous about polytheism, and and it distinguishes itself from Islam and Judaism in that way. Now, 
You emphasize, again, what you call this staggering diversity in Christianity. And not only are there the traditional divisions, Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and Protestantism, within Protestantism, you have the Lutheran, the Reformed, the Anglican, and the Anabaptist tradition. Then you have Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventists, Christian scientists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Evangelicals, Pentecostals. All these people call themselves Christian but they're all somewhat different. Is there any truly common belief in that group of uh, believers? Well, I think so. You know, I think, you know, this is one challenge of teaching and writing about about the world's religions is that you want to uh, say what's shared and you want to make generalizations as you can, but you you also want to see the diversity that's really there. I, I think that Christians agree on that the problem is sin. I think they agree that what they're after is salvation. I think they agree that there's one God in three persons, although mm-hmm. now that's getting dicey because, you know, our Unitarians who believe that uh, Jesus isn't, isn't God, um, are they Christians? Uh, but, I, you know, I, so I think there are those, you know, the, the idea that the Bible is a repository of uh, the word of God, you know, now they're going to disagree on is it infallible? Is it inspired? Whatever. But that the Bible speaks that Jesus is the key, the key figure. You know, I, mean, I think these are shared. Um, that said, you know, Mormons are going to say God has a body. We can become divine. And a Baptist are going to say, you know, you need to be a pacifist if you want to be a Christian. Christianity is about a kind of pacifism. Uh, Catholics say there's a pope. Um, Protestants say there's no pope, that, that only, only God is in charge of, of the church. So, so, yeah, there's an amazing diversity. And once you, you make the Protestant move, which is to say that you can read the Bible for yourself, once you do that, it's sort of anything can happen day, right? I mean, there's just going to be splintering, 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 because everybody's going to be able to read the Bible in different ways. And they're going to feel legitimated by that because the tradition tells them to do so. Right. Now, the form of Protestantism that we hear a lot about in the media today is evangelical Christianity. And you really say that this burgeoned in the 19th century. And you also say it's not the same as fundamentalism. What do you mean by an evangelical? <laughs> Such a great question. I get asked that all the time. Let me see what I, how I can do with it this time. Um, I think the best definition of evangelicals comes from a historian named David Bebbington, and he says that it's about four things. It's about an emphasis on the Bible. It's about an emphasis on Jesus dying on the cross. It's about an emphasis on conversion or new birth, born again. And it's an emphasis on activism, particularly preaching the word and missionizing out in the world. So that distinguishes evangelicals from more liberal uh, Protestants. Now, what distinguishes evangelicals from fundamentalists? Well, the best definition I've heard comes from George Marsden, a historian of American religion, where he says fundamentalists are a subset of evangelicals, which they are, and they're evangelicals who are angry. They're angry about something. And what are they angry about? They're angry at modernity. And, and the distinction is really palpable because with evangelicals, you have this real amazing co-optation of modernity. They're some of the first adopters of radio, of television, of the internet. And they say, listen, we'll, we'll do the organ. We'll do rock and roll music. We'll, we'll sanctify it. We'll Christianize it. We'll evangelicalize it, as it were. And we can use it for our purposes. Fundamentalists are much more wary about that. They're much more you know, leery of the modern world, that modernity is the problem. And fundamentalism is the solution. So the anti-modern ire is the key piece that we see in fundamentalism with people, for example, like like Jerry Falwell in the United States. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it should be said that although politically in this country evangelicals have been aligned in recent decades with the Republican Party and the religious right, there are a lot of evangelicals that are not in that place politically. And that's really important. In fact, if you are to look at evangelicals over the history of America, they have been progressive and liberal far more often than they've been uh, conservative. 
Um, they were in the forefront of the anti-slavery movement. They were in the forefront of the movement for women's rights. They were in the forefront of a lot of reform efforts in the 19th century in terms of prison, in terms of education, um, in terms of uh, settlement houses, etc. Uh, they really have been out to turn America into the kingdom of God. And that they had to do through these progressive avenues. So it's an anomaly to see them on the right. Uh, they've traditionally been on, on the left. That said, there's a lot of evangelicals particularly have come out in the last decade who uh, say, listen, I'm, a, I'm on the religious left. You know, I'm in favor of increasing taxes in order to help the poor. I'm in favor of increasing regulation in order to save the, the environment. And I think the Bible tells me to take care of the poor and to take care of, of the earth. Those are the so-called new evangelicals. That's right. Now, Pentecostalism, again, this is often conflated, I think, in the popular mind with evangelicals, but they're not the same. What's distinctive about Pentecostals? Well, it's a form of worship. You know, it really isn't so much doctrine as it is the form of worship. And if you go into a Pentecostal church, you know you're, you know you're in a different place. <laughs> um, Speaking in tongues and so forth. That's right. Pentecostals are going to be have their hands in the air, which you're going to see with evangelicals and fundamentalists, but they're going to be speaking in tongues, which is they're not going to sound like they're speaking in Spanish or English. Uh, they're going to be you know using these sort of holy tongues, as they call it. They may have faith healing going on in the church, the so-called gifts of the Spirit that you read about in the book of Acts in the Bible, they're saying those didn't end with the early church. Those continue today, and if you just own them in the, if you ask the Holy Spirit to come into your life and your heart and into the the, the place uh, that your church is meeting, that the Spirit will move and create what look to outsiders to be to be miracles. And uh, But the the most palpable of these is definitely speaking in tongues, and, um, and that's really what distinguishes Pentecostalism from other forms of evangelicalism and fundamentalism. You have a section of a chapter which you call the Browning of Christianity. And for people in this country who might go to a church that's largely lily white, there might not be an awareness that the majority of Christians in the world, in fact, are not in Western Europe and North America, that in fact they are in the uh, Southern Hemisphere, actually. Yeah, almost two-thirds of Christians today live in Asia, Africa, or Latin America. So insofar as we have this idea of Christianity as this thing that white Europeans and North Americans do, we, we've just got it wrong. Uh, there's more Catholics in the Philippines than in the homelands of the last two popes of Poland and Germany now. Um, there may be more Christians in China now than there are in all of Europe. So it's an amazing shift. And it's really going in some ways back to the origins of Christianity where it was much more uh, people of color in the Middle East and in Africa, like Augustine, who was African, than it is um, a phenomenon of America and, uh, and Europe. Stephen Prothero is the author of God is not one, the eight rival religions that rule the world and why their differences matter. 